we talked ages ago about the fact that at the end of the 19th century, there were all kinds of social changes going on in the United States, not the least of which was the uh, huge number of immigrants that had come into the US in the 19th century. And I'm not sure whether or not we talked about this, but in the 1790 census, which would have been the first census in the United States, 78% of white Americans were British. Over the course of the next century, there, the US saw immigration from Ireland, Germany, Scandinavian countries, Eastern Europe, Europe Southern Europe, Asia, and that completely altered the percentage such that by the uh, census of 1900, only 41% of white Americans came from Britain. The immigrant, pro pro the, the immigrant uh, increase also brought with it problems, not the least of which was uh, housing. And Trinity Wall Street, which since its founding in 1697 has owned massive amounts of real estate in Manhattan, found itself at the turn of the 20th century being accused of being um, slumlords because whereas southern Manhattan through most of the 19th century had been residential, with the industrial age booming at the end of that century, Trinity Wall Street wanted to move from the tenement buildings that they had into larger industrial buildings. And they got caught in uh, a New York Times sort of spotlight reporting that they were slumlords because they were no longer taking care of the apartment buildings and tenement buildings that they had and instead were putting all their money into building up the area in, on this side of what we now know as the Holland Tunnel. The churches, the Episcopal parishes, responded at around the 1890s to 1900s by establishing a number of inventions that would allow for the immigrant communities to have a place to gather. So, Episcopal parishes in most of the major cities were establishing boys clubs, girls clubs, trade schools, um, settlement homes, um, gymnasia, places for children to play, and cadet battalions. The, you remember that we talked about the women's auxiliary several weeks ago that was established in 1871 by the Emory sisters. And by the turn of the 20th century, they also were addressing social needs. And because most of the women in the group were married to very wealthy men, they were very smart women. And so they very nicely got their husbands to write them checks, which they in turn then wrote for settlement houses and boys clubs and various things. So while their husband, the robber baron husbands, were busy using immigrant labor to build the railroads and, and move the steel and all like that, their wives were quietly using that money to serve the immigrant communities in a totally different way. As we, I think, talked a little bit about at the last time, the Coming into the turn of the 20th century was also a time when the church was trying to grapple with uh, minorities within the Episcopal Church, in particular blacks who were in the church. And they, we spoke about the Sewanee Canon, which was the attempt of the Southern Diocese to create uh, a system wherein black congregations would not have the same sort of representation in the diocesan convention as the white parishes would. And the 
Suwannee Cannon was defeated at the same time that the National Church created something called the Conference of Church Workers Among Colored People. It was organized by a black priest to put more emphasis of the entire Episcopal Church on the reality that there were minority members. Um, we also need to keep in mind that all of this attempt by the Episcopal Church to work out the issues of blacks and whites within the church is also coming at the same time that the country is attempting to work out the implications of all of this. And you might remember that 1895 was the year of the Supreme Court decision, Plessy versus Ferguson. And that was the, one, the decision that established that separate but equal accommodations were okay for blacks living in the United States. So you didn't have to integrate as long as you had separate but equal. But of course, the equal part of it was a little shaky. Um, it was bad, yeah, well said. Anyway, uh, the Episcopal Church in the US at the turn of the 20th century firmly believed that it had to minister to the needs of those outside of its bounds. So in other words, even though Italian immigrants might have been Roman Catholic, Irish immigrants might have been Roman Catholic, uh, Greek immigrants would have been Greek Orthodox, even though that was the case, the Episcopal Church believed firmly that it had to minister to these communities. And it held this belief under something called the establishmentarian ideal. And what that simply means is they held to uh, the idea of establishing an established church. You remember we talked about the Chicago Quadrilateral and the four things that would allow for church unity? Well, the Episcopal Church wanted to take the lead in ministering to the needs of the communities as a way of trying to pull all those Protestant denominations along with them into an established church. This was really important at the end of the 19th century and into the beginning of the 20th century, although uh, it would die out between the two wars in the 20th century. But at the turn of the century, it was still big. This was also a time when women's influence in the church was beginning to increase somewhat. Now, we will remember that it was 1920 when um, women's suffrage won nationally. Uh, but at that time, in the early part of the 20th century, women in the Episcopal Church won the right to vote at annual meetings. Up to this point in time, parish had an annual meeting and only the men could vote. So they had the right to vote at the annual meeting, but they still couldn't serve on the vestry. Nor could they be deputies to general convention. Um, as I think I said when we first talked about the women's auxiliary, one of the reasons that the women's auxiliary uh, was so vital in the life of the Episcopal Church well into the 20th century, well past World War II, was the fact that women did not have a full voice in the life of the church, and the woman's auxiliary was seen as the way, the vehicle through which women could exercise that voice. Uh, at the turn of the 20th century, this was also a time when Episcopal parishes increasingly were composed of members of a single economic or racial group. And that was becoming true nationwide. That was especially true in the South. Although the South, despite everything, the South did have some, some quirky things going on. There were places in the South where blacks and whites worshiped in the same Episcopal church. They just couldn't come in through the same door. So 
There was also a desire to raise up more black men to be clergy. And the fascinating thing is, in the Episcopal Church's desire to do that, they wanted to establish three black colleges, all of which were in the South. So in the uh, 1880s, they established um, black colleges in Raleigh, North Carolina, in South Carolina, in, Vir in Virginia, and they created a black seminary. Many of these southern dioceses, the former members of the Confederacy, also began to create what they called archdeaconries for colored work. In other words, um, hiring a, an archdeacon, a, a person whose job was to go out and encourage the black parishes in the southern diocese, the idea being to build up the membership. Okay? You may remember that many, many weeks ago, before when we were talking about the Civil War, I made the comment that back in the 1850s, because of the evangelization of slaves, there had been a sharp rise in membership in some of the southern dioceses, in particular in South Carolina, where prior to the Civil War, black parishioners outnumbered white parishioners. But that had all changed 40, 50 years later because there had not been the same sort of evangelization, which meant that we got to the turn of the 20th century and all of a sudden people are now paying attention to the fact that there are people in their backyard that aren't part of any congregation. Um, all of this work to raise up black membership, to raise up more black congregations meant that when we got past the turn of the century, people began to realize that there were black priests but there were no black bishops. And so at general convention in 1916, the issue was, or one of, one of many issues, that was a big convention, one of many issues was how can we raise up black bishops? So one suggestion was to go back to the idea of having black convocations and they could then elect their own bishop. But a second idea, the one that prevailed, was based on a change that had been made at General Convention in 1910. Up until 1910, the diocesan bishop was the rector of a parish in the diocese, by and large. Now, he might, might have had several assistants in that parish, but he retained the title of rector. When we got to 1910, by the time we got to 1910, because of all of this expansion in terms of membership from immigrants and, and various other ways, diocesan bishops needed help. The number of parishes had increased dramatically and it was very difficult for one bishop, especially in situations where the diocese was still contiguous with the state, it was very difficult for a bishop to get around. And so in 1910, they passed a canon which allowed for the election of what would be called suffragan bishops. Now a suffragan bishop was an assisting bishop in a diocese and the suffragan had no right, um, no inherited rights, okay? So you would be elected a suffragan bishop and there was no way you would be the bishop. So when the bishop would die, then there would be an election of a bishop. And if my memory is correct, initially the suffragan couldn't run. Now that did change. However, 1910, the canons were changed to allow for the suffragan or assisting bishops. They did not have a vote in the House of Bishops. The only bishops who had a vote in the House of Bishops were the diocesans. And so, in 1916, General Convention realized we have a way that we could create 
black bishops. And they have no place, they have no vote in the House of Bishops. We make them all suffragans. No vote, okay? No right to inherit anything. And so in 1916, that's what they did. They uh, created, a can they amended the canon to uh, say that it could be black or white. And then they proceeded in 1918 to consecrate the first two black bishops in the Episcopal Church. I mentioned a minute ago that the suffragan bishops couldn't vote in the House of Bishops. In 1925, General Convention tried to change that canon. Nobody, <laughs> diocesan bishops didn't want it changed. Nobody who could vote. Nobody who could vote, well, yeah. <laughs> well said, well said. That wouldn't change until 1943, when suffragan bishops would get the right to vote. Today, if you're a bishop and you're at the House of Bishops, you have the right to vote. Doesn't matter if you are retired, doesn't matter if you're an assisting bishop, a suffragan bishop, a bishop coadjutor, a diocesan, any bishop can vote. And there are, we do have a lot of them. I, I'm not sure of the current number, but I want to say that there are pushing 400 living bishops in the Episcopal Church, including, that's including all the retired bishops. Is that a large number? Uh, well, it's probably one. Of, it's probably at the largest it's been, and and I only say that because um, even though our numbers are shrinking, the responsibility of a bishop to visit congregations in the diocese, administer the diocese, et cetera, et cetera, keep increasing. So we may not have as many people as we had 50 years ago, but we have not shrunk the, the infrastructure. And so the end result is, in dioceses that are much bigger than ours, there are often three or four bishops. The Diocese of Texas, which I believe is about 180, 190 parishes, and the Diocese of Texas is Houston, across to Austin, not Dallas, so it's Northeast Texas kind of coming along Route 10. Anyway, they right now have three full-time bishops and an assortment of retired bishops in the diocese. Massachusetts, which probably has about 180 parishes, has two full-time bishops right now, but they've got more retired bishops than you can shake a fist at living down on the Cape. And so, <laughs> and so uh, they are able to tap into that. Now, General Convention will meet in Austin, Texas this summer. Any bishop, including the one who confirmed me, who is now 97, James Winchester Montgomery, any of them can go to the House of Bishops and have a vote. Most of the retired bishops don't go because they don't have a diocese that is going to pay their airfare and their room for the 10 days that they are there. That's, that's a lot of money if you are retired. Even though church pension fund is a wonderful gift, uh, that's still a lot of money. So unless the general convention is in your own backyard, there is a tendency for retired bishops not to attend. Um, among the continued changes in the early 1900s. I turn this way and I see Alicia's name. Yes. And then, I'm, science with Alicia. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it has, I, yeah, I, I don't get, whatever. What, whatever. Okay. In 1912, the Episcopal Church officially ended pew rents. Now, yeah, I, I, I like Christine's look. She has the look of what on earth is a pew rent? Okay, a pew rent is very simple. From colonial days on, 
part of the way that a parish uh, got revenue was renting pews. Now, what I want you to think about is if you've ever been to Old North Church or any churches in the Episcopal Church that date back pre-Revolutionary War, one of the things that is very common to them are what are called boxed pews, which means that uh, unlike Christ Church, where you can slide up and down the pew, a boxed pew might be no wider than this table. We had one in the Episcopal Church that I went to. All right, there you go. And a boxed pew, a, a family would rent it. Now, um, it usually had one pew across, let's say this is the back, let's say you entered here, it usually had a pew here, but it might also have a couple of little stools for the children to sit on. Sometimes they were really fancy, so they had a pew here and then a pew on this side. Well, you rented those. And your pew rent was based on the size. They weren't all the same size, but they were in many parishes they were close to the same size because they were meant to accommodate a family. You paid the rent, that was your seat. You weren't there, nobody else sat in it. Well, as churches continued to be built, but the box pews were no longer being used, just pews like we have, you still rented a pew. So Dixie and Stacy often sit in the second pew on the pulpit side, and Ben told me this week that the rent on that pew is going to go up to 100 a Sunday, okay? So you don't have any problem with that, right? That sounds great. And to be paid even on the Sundays when you can't get here. So, 1912, we officially ended pew rents. Places had ended them before that, but now the National Church said that's it. So, so you rented a pew and then you were still expected to tithe, right? Well, you were still expected to give, and we're going to say something about giving in a minute. Right. So, so uh, it sounds like they had an extortion racket going. Well, we look at it through 21st century eyes, but think back to colonial days, pre- and post-Civil War days, how does a church get revenue so, so that it can function? Well, the other thing is, they weren't heated churches, and those boxes you could put in a burger in there and be warm, and if you were in the pew, you were cold. And the, the other thing is, you're right, in the early days, they weren't heated, and so what you did was you heated a brick at home. Yeah. And you brought a brick, and you would sit there with your feet on your boots on top of the the brick. Um, sometimes it was a heated potato in really early days, you know, when, when uh, bricks were going to be even more expensive, okay? So yes, you're absolutely right. Um, getting rid of pew rents, of course, meant, well, let's say, start another way. The church officially ended them because they viewed them as being undemocratic. Okay, and saw pew rents as a hindrance to church growth because the rental of a pew was based on where it was. So therefore, the pews in the back of the church obviously had a lower rent than the pews in the front of the church. There was also the belief that free seating would appeal to the masses so that people coming in would want to stay if they felt like they could sit anywhere as opposed to no, 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 no. Now, just because we got rid of pew rents doesn't necessarily mean that every Episcopalian didn't believe that they still had a pew. And I can tell you that in 1976, when I moved from Chicago to New York, and uh, so I'm looking trying to figure out, am I going to go to St. James or am I going to go to St. Bart's? And St. Bart's was walking distance from my apartment. So I walked over there on a Sunday morning. This was in September. And I, uh, I went in, and the ushers were in morning coat, OK? So formal dress, more formal daytime dress, OK? And, and not short jacket, long jacket, OK? And uh, so, this usher looked at me and 
said good morning and handed me a bulletin. And I, I was a big girl, so I, nobody was escorting me. So I just walked up the center aisle. I can find the seat. So I walk up the center aisle, empty pew. I plop myself down right on the aisle. So I'm sitting there minding my own business and uh, service hasn't started. All of a sudden, a different usher comes up and looks to me and says, Mr. and Mrs. Hassenpfeffer will, will gladly share their pew with you. <laughs> and I looked up, there were Mr. and Mrs. Hassenpfeffer. I stood up and did the old squeeze against, so they went past me. I had the aisle seat. In other words, what I'm getting at is there, there were people, and th this was 1976, so this was 60 odd years after pew rents were officially ended and yet there were still people who believed this is my pew. We don't see that here <laughs> in the least bit, right? <laughs> so what all this then led to was a new look at how to build revenue. And that new look carried with it the name stewardship. So now, uh, Christine was asking about tithes. There was, it's not that the tithe wasn't known in the 19th century, but the use of that word is very much a 20th century concept because it comes out of this boom of the industrial age where all of a sudden the way a parish defines itself, sees itself, and gets its revenue is changing because the whole world around it is changing. All right? And so we moved into the world of stewardship and that required proper education. So all of a sudden by 1919, the Episcopal Church is now doing every member canvases, which some of you have never heard that phrase, but that was a big phrase in the 20th century. What did you say? They have never heard it in their before. Yeah, yes, you are. I'm telling you. You really are. Been there, done that. Been there, done that. This is when pledges, in the sense that we think of them, began to emerge. So that's 100 years ago. Okay? So, among the other changes, that are coming up at the beginning of the 20th century is the fact that there's going to be a change in music in the Episcopal Church. Oh no! Don't change my music! Oh, sorry. Yeah, right. No, 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 no. Wait a minute. I'm, only, I'm snarking up here because at one level, one might have said that was true in when this all happened in 1916, at another level, the church saw itself improving music. Um, backdrop. Back in 1789, when the first prayer, American prayer book was passed, it had 27 hymns in it, the texts for which were appended to the back of the prayer book. Okay? The 27 hymns that were in there were based on psalms because that was what was considered proper hymnody. Unless you were in a cathedral in somewhere in England where you had a larger choir, um, music like William Byrd, Thomas Tallis, all like that, was only being sung in college or cathedral churches. So these 27 psalms were the hymns. And by and large, the uh, hymn tunes would have been uh, what we call metrical. What I mean by that is, uh, Oh God, our help, been ages past, our hope for years to come. That's metrical, all right? So, 27 hymns, but no tunes are in there, okay? And... I'm not totally sure how they would have necessarily been sung, except I have this feeling that much of it might have been a cappella, but don't hold me to that. In 1826, 
we reissued the 1789 prayer book, and this time it had 212 hymns in it, no tunes. But we began to pick up um, hymns of the Wesleys and various other hymn writers from the 18th century. And I encourage you, although not during Ben's sermon, but I encourage you, when we, start, when we sing a hymn, start reading the footnote at the bottom of the page. I know you sing all the notes and the music, and you probably have never spent time reading what's at the bottom of each hymn. And what's at the bottom is who wrote the words and when, to what century or date they are dated, and then who wrote the music, okay? Um, in 1828, we finally decided that maybe we needed to have something that had some tunes in it so that people had some vague idea of what the music looked like. So we got a tune book in 1828, but it was separate from the Book of Common Prayer. 1871 was the big, big revision of hymnody in the Episcopal Church. That was the first standalone hymnal, and it had 502 hymns in it. There was a lot of new stuff in it, Christmas stuff, Easter stuff, um, stuff from composers of the 19th century like Mendelssohn, um, Samuel Sebastian Wesley, etc. In 1896, four years after the 1892 prayer book, we issued a hymnal that had 679 hymns in it. We have had a tendency, once we finally embrace the idea of a hymnal, we've had a real tendency to uh, go overboard with the number of hymns. Some of you may have noticed that the 1982 hymnal, which we have now, has 720 hymns in it. And some of them are just repeats of different tunes, though. So, and that, that is the other thing that we do. A hymn that goes in, the text can be the same, the tune is different, it gets a new number. The, uh, anyway, 1916, we created this new hymnal. Now, it took them six years to get there, which is really pretty, pretty good. They started working on it in 1910. It was viewed at the time that the most important consideration was that the music and the words in the hymnal be in good taste. The idea then was that the standards of music and poetry at the beginning of the 20th century was far superior to what it had been with any previous edition of the hymnal. And so they saw themselves as knowing exactly what needed to be in there. They put in 559 hymns. They dropped 200 from the 1896 book. It was praised as a visible demonstration of the liberality of general convention to the devotional demands of the time. That's all fancy for saying, oh, oh we did a great job. That's it. They, in, in creating the 1916 hymnal, they were looking for sturdier compositions. So uh, a lot of sort of um, Appalachian style, uh, Southern harmony style hymns that had been in the 1871 were removed because they weren't sturdy enough. Now this is, this is not a literal example, but what I'm saying is they would have not, they wouldn't have liked um, something like what wondrous love is this. That would not have been considered sturdy. They wanted, now bear in mind, think of what time, of the, what, what time in world history. 1910 to 1916 is when they are working on this hymnal. What's going on in the world around them? Well, the start of, and indeed, World War I, beginning in Europe, and so now we're looking to rally ourselves 
okay, at one level. So, things, hymns like Hail Thee Festival Day, which is a tune from the Middle Ages, came into the hymnal because that really got you going. Uh, a Mighty Fortress, believe it or not, A Mighty Fortress had not been in the hymnal until 1916. I mean, we sing it today like, it's, like we've been singing it since Luther wrote it, but nope, we hadn't. Um, they borrowed a lot from English poetry, um, a hymn that is still in the hymnal, He Who Would Valiant Be Against All Disaster, which I think is Bunyan, if my memory is correct, and I'm not positive about that. Um, and uh, then they also looked at contemporary poetry. And so a hymn like Dear Lord and Father of Mankind was written by a poet, if my memory is correct, he died in World War I, whose name is just going right out of my head. So this was also a time when the worldwide Anglican communion was beginning to engage in prayer book reform. Now you say to me, but didn't we just reform it in 1892? Yeah. Don't they start the next revision, the daily, uh, the previous one's been accepted? Don't they what? You start the new revision the day after it's been accepted? There's a joke that, that Episcopalians, Anglicans in general have done that, but again, the times, the, the whole world is changing. I mean, Canada, has got an influx of immigrants. Britain is seeing its composition um, changing with Irish men coming over. And the Church of Ireland, meaning the Anglican Church of Ireland, is looking at the 20th century and looking at these old texts and saying something's got to change. So in the first two decades of the 20th century, Ireland, Scotland, Canada, South Africa, and India are all working on prayer book reform. Britain also was working on prayer book reform, which would be rejected in 1927. They would come back and pass a new version in 1928, and Parliament would once again reject prayer book reform. The United States was no different. So, even though we had just modified the 1789 prayer book in 1892, now all of a sudden we realize we didn't go as far as we could have gone. So we also engaged in prayer book reform, which would take us well into the 1920s because, of course, the book that would come out would be the 1928 Book of Common Prayer. Um, Were they rejected because they came from a black community? What, the British one? No, no, the Church of England is subject to Parliament. So in order for the Church of England to get a new official prayer book, Parliament has to endorse it. And if Parliament doesn't pass it, it won't happen. And so in 1927 and 1928, the Church of England endorsed it, passed a new prayer book. And Parliament said, no, nope, we're not going to do that. Which, because they are a state church, they don't have, their hands are tied in terms of revision. What that means, and actually I just realized I'm going to have to stop, so we'll talk about our own prayer book revision next week. What that means is that the official prayer book for the Church of England is the 1662 prayer book. Wow. Is that the one they actually use though, even though it's not, even though it's been... it, it is official. And so when Harry and Meghan are married in May, they will be married using the 1662 Book of Common Prayer, not using common worship, which we've taken prayers from, and the Eucharistic prayer during Lent at 1017 came from common worship. Common worship is, is a revision of the prayer book that was issued in the year 2000. But it is not the official prayer book. So Parliament is still vetoing the, the, uh, the Church of England has pretty much decided that they are going to have what's called a stand-along. So in other words, here's 1662. It is official. 
Here's common worship. You can use it. You can use it till the cows come home. The queen dies, 1662. The royal family gets married, 1662. But I would, I would suggest to you right now that probably, a, I was going to say half. I can't say that because I can't say I've seen numbers. I would say to you a good number of local parishes in England are using common worship. Why? Because it's, it's easier. It's much more accessible than um, 1662. 1662 makes right one look like it's contemporary. And I'm not criticizing right one. I'm just trying to say, when you talk about Elizabethan English, Okay, 1662 is only 60 years after she died. And it is very much that, that style of writing, which can be very difficult for people. Cumbersome. Cumbersome is the word, is the word. So anyway, we'll talk about wars and prayer book reform, and all the good stuff of the 20th century next week. <laughs>